sit down. Um, we have Malika again today. We're going to talk about um, probate today. We're doing a probate class. Uh, we're going to leave this kind of Q&A, uh, but Malika McGanty will go ahead and get started just to kind of give us the information and the basics. And then from there, um, feel free to ask any questions because I know it's such a heavy topic at times. And um, like I said earlier, uh, lunch is provided with from First American Home Warranty. And um, feel free to just speak up whenever you'd like. Yeah. Thanks for having us again, by the way. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday. So um, probate is the one word, I guess, when we hear that, people kind of get nervous. You know, you're like, what does probate mean? But to me, in black and white, uh, probate is when we need to go to the courts and get a court approval to be able to sell the property. We've got literature in here, too, that I'll go over on the flyer. But in black and white, probate means that when we have a seller that is on title, anybody that's on title, you guys, if they don't have another party on title with them, they're on a, a title as their sole sole entity and it's an unmarried woman or unmarried man and they pass away, it's automatic probate, just so you know. So if you've got a client and you want to look at those title reports and find out who's on title, if you've got an elderly person who is selling the home because of their situation, you know, their health care and they're going downhill and things aren't that great, you really want to get yourself prepared because you could be doing all of this homework, this listing, this marketing, paying for the marketing. <laughs> and if that seller passes away during your transaction, that can put you at a complete halt if they are not vested in a living trust. The only way to avoid a probate is through a living trust, meaning your seller has to be untitled in a living trust. That is what avoids probate. So that's the best way here at your title company at escrow, when we're signing your clients, we're educating them, every single buyer, that that is the best way to hold title so that they have the wisdom when they walk away, you know, look, if anybody passes away during this time, the house will automatically go to probate. And the probate means that, that the judge and the attorneys are going to get paid and they are going to be, be making the final decisions. Okay. So I get um, a lot of times they'll say, well, you know, um, we're already in escrow and they've already signed the listing agreement or I have a power of attorney you know, with the transaction. And for those of you that don't know, why do you have a power of attorney in place? If that person passes away, the power of attorney is immediately void. You cannot have power over somebody that has passed away. Yes. If, if, well, if somebody else is on title and they're still alive, then you would avoid probate. So it's only when somebody is on title by themselves, by themselves, or Heaven forbid, we see it, it, you know, husband and wife, they get into an accident or something happens, heaven forbid, they both pass, both sellers pass away, you're dealing with probate. Um, so it's automatic. So you want to, you always want to look at your title. Title, your prelim is the first thing that tells you who's there, you know, who is there. And you've got a seller who is not for healthcare, it is going down. You want to get them prepared. We, we've got amazing resources for trust attorneys, probate attorneys that we can refer to you. My trusted probate attorneys will directly go to the care homes. They will go to the homes. They have to do their own validation. They have to interview the people. They have to validate them, make sure, figure out where their mind is. Sometimes they're in their right mind and sometimes they are not. You know, So all of that will come into play and we can avoid a probate transaction if you know it ahead ahead of time. You know, if you know your seller's not doing well, might not make it through this whole deal, please reach out to, to us and we will hook you up with the right people so that you can get your trust done ahead of time before they pass away. You can get things done before or something else in place so that you can avoid probate. Yes. So I had a situation once where they have health and they can trust. Yes. Or they took it out and they put it back in. Yes. And we were in escrow and we closed, but the person passed away um, like two days after or something after we closed. So if he would have passed away while we were in escrow. And it was in a trust? It wasn't in a trust. They took it out and then we put it back in. Ooh. So that would have. That would have, that would have made it to where there's two types of probates. There's a 
there's a regular probate and then they call it a Hegstead probate. Uh -huh. So Hegstead probate is where you can shorten the time frame. That would be like a Hegstead probate, meaning if they had the intent to put it in the trust, they already had a trust set up, but maybe they refinanced and just yeah. didn't put it back into the trust after the fact. I see it all the time. So then I will go through and, and sometimes, sometimes we can avoid probate. You know, I've had it to where we had to go back to the pork if we didn't have anything to do with it, what's called a Hegstead, because they knew what their intent was. The, okay. the, the judge will see, they can clearly see they had a trust, it should have been in there. So you can get what's called a Hegstead, it's done a lot quicker, and you can get on the calendar to get, get that approved by the court. I just had one that we did that way. So we got the court order. We got administrated and automatically put back into the trust to avoid it. It depends on the estate and how much they had involved. I just had one last year that closed after six years of probate. And imagine all the money, every time that attorney gets a phone call or an email, all that, that money and that equity is going into their pockets. Yeah. Yeah. So it would behoove you to educate your clients. That's a great marketing tool. You know, do you guys know how to avoid probate? Do you guys know how to hold title? A lot of people don't know. And what a lot of people will do, I, I hear this, yeah, I'd say three times a week, that they'll say, they'll call up and say, I just want to add so-and-so to title. You know, I want to add my girlfriend or I want to add my partner, or whoever it is, my kids to title. I hear a lot. And then um, the knowledge that we give them that I tell them is, look, if you want, what's the situation? Do you want to hear what they have to say and what really is going on? But the best advice you can tell them is please go spend your money on a, a trust attorney, because if something were to happen, um, that trust attorney is going to prepare all of your wishes, which you're going to be able to dictate what you want to happen with your assets. So if you've got um, properties with multiple, say multiple children, a couple different marriages, we see it all times. You can do a trust for part A, first set of family, trust for part B, the second set of family, and trust C for, you know, the new family that we've created. So there's different layerings of trust that you can actually do. I see it all the time. Um, so that will protect that. That will totally protect you. Yes. Great question. No, it does not. As long as it's the same entity and you have to prove to the recorder when you record it into the trust, you have to give them the appropriate documentation to prove that this entity, this individual is the same individual into the trust. Same for an LLC or a corporation. You can change it from an individual to their corporation or LLC. As long as you provide the right paperwork to the county when you do it, that way you can avoid being reassessed. Um, and just know this. So I will tell people when they want to add their family or you know somebody to title just for the what ifs. Look, just so you guys know, living a living trust will avoid um, the county reassessing it. You know, they're going to reassess at time of death. Just know that. But if it's the same entity going in, they're not going to reassess you when you go into a trust. Going to, um, and you're also going to avoid capital gain. That's a huge thing with a trust that a lot of people don't know. There's a lot of reasons to have a trust bank account, you guys. But one of the biggest reasons is so that you avoid paying taxes on that money. If you are, a, um, you know, an inheritor of that money, if you're the one to get paid, you're getting it distributed through the trust. If it goes through the trust bank account, you're not hit with capital gain. You're not being capital, you don't have to add it as income. It's considered an inheritance. So there's different, different ways to do it. But a lot of times I will come across when I tell people about a trust, I want them to know you just don't need the trust. You actually got to go get, you know, your trust um, bank account set up. I have an escrow right now that they have what we avoided uh, the probate because they had a trust, but the bank accounts were not set up in the trust. So now we're in probate for the bank accounts. And people don't know that. Or they'll go, oh, yeah, I have one set up. And I tell them, you should put your trust name on every bank account that you have. Because if you do not, the banks are going to automatically freeze those accounts when they get wind of that, that party passing away. They're going to freeze them. And you're not going to have access to go pay the mortgage if you're trying to pay it out of their account. If you have a trust bank account set up, you'll be able to keep business as usual, keep making that mortgage until you guys can get it sold, keep paying the utilities, the HOA and whatnot. If you have a trust bank account, because they will, you have access to that, you're immediately in power when somebody passes away. Now, a lot of times people get nervous to ask sellers for 
private information. And some sellers are nervous to even provide us with their information. I hear it. I'm not going to give you my trust, you know, they'll tell us, but just know this, we're your neutral third party. And when we're asking for it, there's a reason. And the black and white, I can give you some wisdom today that you can use for the rest of your career. We only need the living trust if somebody has passed away. If your players, you know, Jane and John Doe are still alive and they are invested in their trust, I don't need their trust. As long as they're alive and well, I don't care. They're here to sign for themselves, right? So think about it that way. But if they're not here to sign for themselves, then I'm going to need a copy of the death certificate. I don't need a certified on a trust, but I need a copy of it. I'm going to need also that um, executor, whoever the successor trustee is, they're going to have to get what's called a tax ID number. It's fairly simple. Probably takes about 10 minutes, if that, on the computer. Or you call your tax person who did the taxes for that party and say, look, can you please pull a tax ID number for me? And what that does, it lets the good old franchise and IRS know that this person has passed away, that social is no longer valid, and we're now being signed a new social. Basically, they're stamping you out. When you come out of your parents, you get a social stamped on your forehead. When, you're, when you die, you can request a tax ID, you're asking for a new social. But it's called a tax identification number or um, an EIN number. So it'll start with like 96-877-370. And that's what we we'll use in place of the social. But why that's important is we don't want to report the sale under the successor trustee. Whoever's there filling out their paperwork, like you were doing it before dad, you don't want to put your soul on anything. So I pull my clients right out of the gate. Give me that seller's phone number or whoever's authority that's dealing with it. And I tell them, please, I don't care who asks you, the agents, TC, whoever, us, do not put your personal social on any of this paperwork. You have to create, remember, we don't want to report the sale under you as an individual because they would be highly upset if they got 1099 with this money um, added to their income. We want to report it under the trust. And once they hear that, they're like, checkmate. You know, they get it. They understand that. But, but just so you guys have that knowledge, that is what your seller is going to need to do immediately. Well, along with getting me a copy of the death certificate. Sometimes the death certificates aren't ready. I have one right now that's not ready. They... Um, the quickest way to get it is through the funeral home. And those of you that don't know, you want to request that death certificate through a funeral home, even if it was a year later and you needed that death certificate and you're in a crunch, you're trying to close escrow, you go to that funeral home, they'll get it quicker if anybody does. They will be able to attain it quickly. But we want to get that because we have to validate that that person actually passed away. And then we're going to tell you, we need the trust. And I always start with asking my clients, do you guys have a binder? Because a lot of trust attorneys can put it into a binder and people will remember, oh, I know where that binder's at. You know, um, so I'll start with the, that word. Do you guys have the binder or do you have the trust documents? And I don't need everything out of that binder, out of the trust paperwork. I really only need the trust itself because you'll have a health directive, power of attorney, wills, all kinds of other stuff in there for their other assets, but I don't need that. Really what we're looking for, it'll start with the table of contents and it will end with the last page being signed and notarized. So if the, and it'll actually tell you the page numbers too. It'll say, you know, page 37, page 39. If I'm missing one of those pages in between, I'm not gonna close, it's gonna be a problem because I need to make sure I see what page 29 said. That could, you know, we have to honor, the reason we're asking for this is we're trying to honor their original wishes. We're not trying, we will honor their original wishes. So that's the whole reason for it. We're not trying to dive in who's getting what. We don't care about that. All our job is, is to keep us out of court and make sure that we don't have anybody else contesting this and that we have done our job and we have honored their original wishes. So that's really the reason that we, that, or the reason why we request that. And it's easy for your clients. You guys, if you, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're all about about it, you'd be going to your seller's house, getting that trust and bringing it to me. And I'm going to make a copy real quick, scan it, give it right back to you. You can take it back to your client. Or you send your client in, you know, bring it into the office. It takes us less than five minutes. We'll literally take a scan of it. We'll pull it right out. We know what we're looking for. We're going to scan it through and your client can be on their way. Even if your client was in Hawaii or the Maui Island, they can walk into my Maui office, you know, or Honolulu, you know, Oahu, they can go into that office. If they were in San Diego, I've got one there too, you know, so we can make it pretty easy. But you're going to come across situations where they don't really have it on PDF. They don't have it that all the time. So if they are in their elder, if they don't know where it's at, if they've had a trust done through an attorney, somebody does it through an attorney. I didn't do mine through an attorney. So I'm in the business, right? So I did it myself. But if you have an attorney, 
that attorney will keep that trust on file too. So they can always, and even if they sold their practice to the new person, they can call up and they can request it PDF. It may cost them because every time you make a phone call to an attorney, there may be a cost associated. So I always try to go to the client first and get it there, but then I'll tell them, hey, you could also have this option. I just want to tell you, you know, there may be a cost, but please have them PDF. The attorneys around here, they'll PDF it to me in two minutes. They know why they're doing it. They know what's going on and, and they're happy to help. So just to have that knowledge as well. Um, and a lot of times there's not just one trust. I had one the other day. There was five amendments. <laughs> there was a trust with five different amendments. So they may change, switch gears, add someone in, take somebody out, add someone in, take somebody out. And then there ended up being two co-successor -tr trustees. So if I had to deal with two people and you have this listing agreement already signed and sealed and delivered and thinking that you're, you're on your way. But really, if I've got two players over here that actually need to be the one that signed, you don't have a valid listing. So you're going to want to make sure that do your due diligence. You know, this is part of when you open up a free escrow, this is what we should be doing ahead of the, ahead of time. And I tell my players, if you work with me, you know, I'll say, look, hey, when we get that offer, I'm ready to close in five days, you know, but I will tell you to hold until I give you that green light, you know, but once we're done, if your seller gets an offer and it's great and you want to close it in three or five days, I'm ready to do so. But if you don't do this up front, you've got to get through all of that ahead of time. Okay. And, and then also it's stressful for your clients. It's a stressful situation. Somebody's died. It's emotional. And you got to think about in their, you know, a lot of times it's older people too. They don't live like us. We can get things done quickly, but they don't live like us. So when you're telling them, I need the trust, I need the death certificate, by the way, you got to go have a trust bank account set up. They're feeling overwhelmed. So if you can handle these things up front, piece one task at a time. It's a lot easier for a client to take it in. They feel better about it. They're not being rushed and it makes for a better communication all around, I believe. You know, and it shows that you've done your homework, your fiduciary duty is to make sure that you've led them in a great direction, that, that they want to refer you for years to come. That's why you're in it, right? So you want them to have that good experience. So that would be what you would do to um, avoid being in that position. Now, um, so that's with trust, with probates. I'm going to go over what this flyer says. Do I, do I always talk off the cuff? I'm just going off of what's in this head up here. But let me go and tell you what this <laughs> Okay, so it says probate, some basics. Everyone has, a will or, everyone has a will or plan, whether created or by default. Even if you have not made out a will or a trust, you still have a plan. A plan dictated by the laws of the state where you reside upon your death Making a will is not a way to avoid probate. I hear that all the time. They'll go, well, they have a will, you know, can we avoid probate? And I say, no, because a will is not on title, but at least we know what their intent was. That is going to help the trust attorney or the courts to be able to help this probate go through even quicker. Um, so making a will is not a way to avoid a probate. The court procedure that changes the legal ownership of your property after your death. Probate makes sure it is your last valid will, appoints the executor named it and supervises the executor's work, which is great because when you have somebody that passes away that didn't have a will, they're going off the cuff and appointing who you know. And sometimes I'll have sometimes it's it's the chaplain. Sometimes it's somebody the their CPA. I get all walks of life. I had one lady that she went to the church with a dude. This girl got two houses out of it. She didn't barely know the guy. You know. <laughs> That's who he left it to, you know, so it was, just, it was a young girl, too. I'm like, you are so lucky, but she didn't even know. She went to the church with the dude. He had no kids, no family, left it all to her. Um, she ended up being the one appointed. <laughs> um, so just just so you know, when you ask them if they don't, you know, do you guys have a will? OK, we'll take that will down to your trust attorney so they, they can get things going. And they're going to be talking to them about what their new wishes, because that will could have been you know, five years ago and things could have changed, but it's great that they have that, that will assist with getting that trust put together or the probate. Um, it says you can do several things now that you can help your executor and family later, hopefully much later on. One question, I'm in possession of a will that distributes the descendant's estate to me. Isn't that all I need? No, the will must be admitted to probate and the estate of the descendants must be probated. So just because they have it means we actually need what's called a probate order signed by the judge. And well, actually, I'll stop talking because I know it's going to go into that. 
And we're going to be recording that, just so you know. That's going to record with our transaction so that we can show the trail. When somebody looks at that title, they'll be able to see, oh, so-and-so passed. Then there's a court order. Oh, this shows why this person was allowed to sell the property. You have to be able to show the story. Um, what does probate actually mean? Generally, probate is a court proceeding that administers the estate of an individual. What is the purpose of the estate administration? Generally, there are five purposes, many of which have, have subsets to them. Number one, to determine the descendant is in fact passed away. To establish the validity of the will. Number three, to identify the heirs and devices of the descendant. Number four, to settle any claims that creditors may have against the estate of the descendant. And number five, to distribute the property. So that's six, uh, whoever that is, whoever gets appointed, they have a job ahead of them. They've got to handle all of this, all of these items. It says, who is public administrator? Generally speaking, a public administrator is a person or entity appointed by the state to act when there is no will or relatives. So that's what they'll appoint whoever. So those are great things to be asking your clients when you're going in for a listing agreement. You know, by the way, if you guys have a trust, oh no, you guys have a will. Okay, well, just see, let me give you some knowledge about how, you know, the best way to hold title. Because a lot of people don't know. They just don't. On page two, you guys, it'll say, what is the difference between testate and intestate? When one is said to have died testate, it means that he or she died leaving a will. So they actually had a will. We know that they had one. If one is said to have died intestate, it means he or she died without leaving a will. So those are the differences. What is the difference between an executor and an administrator? An executor carries out the directions and requests set forth in the descendant's will. An administrator is appointed by the court to manage the estate of a descendant who dies intestate. So now they've, they're, they've now inherited that job. That's what, and they've administrated them to do it. What are the steps to a normal uncontested probate? So generally speaking, number one, we have the descendant, the will is delivered to the executor or the court clerk. A petition is filed for the probate or will or letters of administration. So this is what the trust attorney is going to be doing on, on you know, the party's behalf. Um, and they're going to file for probate or of will or letters of administration. Now, those letters of administration, just so you guys know, when this process gets going, we always ask the title company is going to say, do you know when those notice of proposed actions weren't out? Because what that is doing is saying, hey, to the family members, anybody that may contest it, just so you know, this is who we are appointing. Does anybody object to this situation? We're stating that they can sell this house for they'll actually have a dollar amount on there. They won't allow them to not, ex you know, to any less than, and that they're appointing to a certain person. But they're going to mail that out. And once they send that out, they have 15 days to contest. So we legally cannot close escrow until 15 days after those letters have been distributed. Now, there's a way around that. You can actually get them, those people, everybody that's sent off, whoever the, the people are. If there's five or six, sometimes there's two, sometimes there's one, sometimes there's 15 I've had. But if they will come back and say, hey, we're not going to contest, if they agree to it, and we can close quicker. I don't have to wait the full 15 days. So there is a way around that, just, just FYI. But that's what the letters do. A hearing is held on the petition. The letters of administration are issued by the court. And that letter is actually of administration is what we actually record. So sometimes you may be in a position where your client's calling you and saying, hey, I've already got probate approval. I've already got probate approval. I would like you to just look at the home. I already have it. So you're going to want, you're going to say, okay, great. I would want to know as a listing agent, let me see that probate approval. I want to see it. Um, because that actual letters has to be certified, signed by the court, and it needs to be embossed. Because we're going to be utilizing that, you know, to record with our, our other trans, our other documents for the grant deed and the deed of trust. I can't close escrow without that certified letters of administration. And sometimes people will say, oh, well, this is all I have, you know, and you can have a certified one. But we just go back to the attorney and we'll request it. I've had some attorney go, well, I don't know. I can't get it. I'm like, you need to get it. They paid you for it. Go get it. But I do have a workaround. I have resources. I can pull that thing if I need to. It's going to cost you a little bit, but we can do it. So just FYI, those situations come up a lot. And when you get that, immediately take that paperwork to your escrow officer, have them review it, figure out exactly what you're going to need to close. 
but that's the letters of administration that we're actually looking for. Then the notice to creditors is given. Some people think that they don't have to pay off people's you know, debts if they passed away, they're like, we're dead. You know, <laughs> it doesn't always just go away. <laughs> so just FYI, you know, have some money for that. Um, inventory and appraisement of the estate is made by an independent probate appraiser. We get phone calls on this all the time. When people pass away, even the county assessor will call escrow and say, hey, what's the date of that death certificate? Do you know when they actually passed away? So just for your knowledge, the, the county will be reassessing that property at the time of death, from the date of death until the day they get wind of it. So just so you know, tax will be reassessed once they passed away. Um, and, and, and even if so, say you had two sellers on title and one had a 50% share that was probated and the other one um, is still alive and well. I've had that happen. Well, we've got to go get probate for just 50% of it, right? Um, so when that happens, the other seller, you know, we want, we warn them, hey, you're going to be getting a supplemental tax bill down the road and it will be your responsibility. We don't know what that bill is yet because it's not even been used. But in everybody's escrow instructions, just so you know, it'll tell you, hey, guys are going to be getting a supplemental escrow is not involved and we don't get wind of it. It's your responsibility to pay for it. So you want to warn your sellers that you know that the way are the successors. You're going to be getting a bill. Don't go distribute all that money right away. The supplemental is going to be coming. And if it's Solano County, two years down the pipe, you'll be it will be well. But just know that you don't want to distribute everything because you've got some bills coming through. Um, okay, so the next thing is you have to file their federal estate tax return. Return states no tax due or specifies an amount due. The final accounting and petition for distribution is done and the final decree of distribution. Then they discharge of the personal representative. Once they've distributed all the money, then, then your job is done. You know, whoever is, is appointed to. But that's what the job is for somebody that is not in a trust and has been appointed as the administrator of the trust. This is their responsibilities. You know, you can get it done. It depends on money, money, money matters. You know, you can wait six months or you could say, look, I'm trying to close escrow. I want to get it. I'm willing to pay even more to get on the port calendar quicker. So you can, depends on what much money you got. Huh? Money talks. Yeah, I've had it. I've had it numerous times. I'm like, oh, do you guys got money? So we can get out of the court with her, you know? And they, yeah, and we'll do it. You know, the attorneys will do it. You can also, you know, that the value of the property in the SMA, that's more than the past for some of the things. And that's a big deal. It, it, and, and it'll show you, they will remember you too. It'll be like, Ed, help me on that. Because everybody's going to have a family member sooner or later that passes away. And, and they, in the county, they don't want a penny slip. The minute they get win, they may not have that win this year, but they might get win two years down the road and they're going to go reassess those taxes. Yeah. No, one person. They that on 50% of the value. Yep. Yes. Unless it's husband and wife. Unless it's husband and wife. Yes, but if it's a different individual, then yes. So just know that, you know, just know that. The best way to hold title, if you guys don't know and don't have a living trust, is in if it's uh, a married couple, husband and wife, or wife and wife, or whatever it is, as community property with right of survivorship. That is the one way to avoid the county reassessing your taxes. Now, that used to not be out 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was joint tenants, and that's all we knew, which is right of survivorship but the county will reassess you on joint tenants now at the time of death. So if somebody's on a fixed income, that can push you right out of that house. <laughs> yeah, you want to make sure you're not entitled to joint tenants. <laughs> yeah. you know, so that's um, that's that caveat, just FYI. Um, the next thing says, while real property is in probate, can it be sold? Yes, I'll get into too much. It can be sold either at private sale in which the executor of the estate negotiates, negotiates a transaction with the buyer and at public sale in which the property is sold at public auction. So yes, just because we're in probate doesn't mean that we can't close it. Once those notice of proposed action has been out and the 15 days have lapsed or we can get consent that they've consented to it, I can close the next day. Okay. Um, is If there is no will, how is the property of the estate distributed? I really don't know what does it say. Section 6400 through 6414 of the California addresses intestate succession and the distributions. 
The method and manner of intestate distributes is quite complex, and therefore one should specifically discuss intestate distributes, distributions with his or her legal advisor. Always a result of a knowledgeable attorney. Yes, and I have amazing probate attorneys, you guys. I have really, really good attorney, really, uh, probate attorney that I use and that I refer um, as she's amazing. Her name's Yvonne Asher, and she's got this, I don't know she's a New Zealander, but she's got this English accent. I'll do whatever she tells me. She's so nice about it. No, but really, the reason I use her is because she doesn't cost gauge my clients. I'm about... I'm about money. I watch it every day. I'm watching what people charge clients. I can see one attorney charge 10 grand. I can see another attorney charge 3,500 apples to apples. You know, it should be more money when there's more properties involved and more assets, but there's one house, one couple, they should not be paying $10,000 for trust um, or for probate. So it's, and it depends on their timing. That is why I refer to Yvonne. Not only that she pulls through every single time, she's amazing. The clients and she um, compassionate to the situation. You'd be surprised about these attorneys and who you come across who's not even compassionate about the situation you're dealing with or the people, you know. So she is very compassionate, and um, that's why I utilize her. Yvonne Thrasher, that Y V O N N E Thrasher. She's right here on it's I want to say 78 Certain Street in Vacaville, and she's great. Yep. Yeah, she's great. Great attorney, great trust attorney, great probate attorney. And she can't step in and kill her other partner. They're there to help. And any convoluted stuff, that is my go-to team. And I have answers immediately. They're great. She's a deal we had um, that it was a, that seller had passed. Uh, the appointee person that we're waiting to get appointed hadn't had the money to pay the mortgage. So the property was in default. They were about to go to sale. I kept calling to try to stop to stop the sale. But um, we ended up getting it literally like within four months sale going through, but we had to pay extra money to get into that damn court before the probate, you know, before the sale date happened. But we pulled it off. It was right there at the thread. But she pulls, we pull them off, you know, she's amazing. So properties could be foreclosed on when it's foreclosed, right? Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah, and if in the what I was doing, what I'll tell them is, hey, why do you want to go to the sale? I've got money. I'm ready to pay you off. Quit sending your attorneys down there. Quit spending your money. And those words, there, you know, that saves saves you a little bit. They're like, okay, you know, and I'm like, you see my request. You see, I've got it in. You see my payoff date. So you want to be able to talk to the trustee and make sure that they know that they don't want to spend the money if they don't have to. But sometimes it could be too far gone. You never know. They can do what they want. I can ask and present it. It doesn't mean they have to listen to me. We have a yeah. question in the chat. Uh, remind them how long probate is and its cost. I don't know. It all changes. It depends on the actual situation. So one property, is there multiple properties? And the cost would be directly from the attorney. I don't have a clue, to be honest. Next question. Is it possible one has recorded their own trust without an attorney? Yep, me. Yep, I did my thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been in this business. I'm going on 34 years. And so for years, I'd be telling people, do the trust. That's right. You need to do. And even I didn't have a damn trust. I didn't really have a pot to piss in, to be honest with you either, for to leave my kids. But, you know, now I do. I live on Wyckoff, so I got quite a bit of equity in there. And um, and I have kids that are 29 and 30 years old. So when COVID hit, I thought, well, I'm type 1 diabetic, so I better go get, you know, I better do my trust. So I prepared it, did it, and recorded it. And, and people don't know, but... You definitely need to give that trust or a copy of your binder to your successors. Like for my two kids, I appointed them both co-successor trustees. They both must act together unless one can't. Um, and they need to make sure they have the copy of it because as a title company, the neutral third party is going to say, I need that trust. And I've had situations even with these LNU fires that the trust burned down, they couldn't get a copy. Then we're back in court. We're back in court for a Hegstead probate because they don't have a copy. If you don't have a copy or the mom never gave you a copy. I've had that happen when the mom never gave her a copy, the daughter a copy. And so she had to go to probate anyway because she didn't have the copy to get appointed. So you can't just sell like, you know, just because you want to, you have to have the appropriate paperwork. 
Now, Malik, I know you did your own documents, but you would not recommend that. Correct? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I just want to, I just no, want to be back here. Okay. And here's why. Because I, you know, what has happened to me? My kids lost their copy of their class and they couldn't get access to safe and now they don't know. They're going to end up in court anyway. So if you have to do it through a real estate attorney, they will actually have to keep one on file. So that's a huge, huge player. And I might even, you know, just to be transparent, I might have Yvonne even redo mine. I just had to do it quickly and make sure that they, my kids were covered because I got too much equity sitting there. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Sure. So with all this, like the motion lawsuits going on and stuff like that, we're like, okay. <clears throat> We need to make sure that all of our properties are in a trust so that they're protected. Yeah. That's inaccurate. Right. So, so they're protected from death, yes, but not liability. Yeah. yeah. So oh. that was an interesting piece for us to others to learn. And so if there's a thought that I am in a trust, I am now protected, that's not true. No. LLC. LLC or something. Or put that in the LLC into the trust. Yep. That. I have a I have a client right now that I'm working on today that has an LLC in their trust. Yeah. Oh my God, it's just that now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just like so for like when someone trips and falls and they sue you, um, and it goes to the full extent of the limits, and then so, right, what do they come out? And then whoever has the most money, right? Whoever has the deepest pockets. That is why it's our job to keep us out of court. Your your title company. When we're asking for your paperwork and asking for it, it you know might seem annoying, but we're here to protect you. You're the one with the license, and then you're protecting your broker by providing it to us. Because when people people are so happy, there's a thing. I mean, you say it's purple, and they say it's red, and you advertise that it was red, and it's really purple. They're going to sue you over it. You know, that's the bottom line. That's that's what we live in now. So you must cover your faces at all times. The other question that I don't think it's a standard, but six to nine months is what I hear the turnaround time. You know, I don't, I, I honestly, I'm transparent. I don't know. I don't know. I know that I, when I'm in situations, I know that you can pay more to get on that court, that court calendar quicker. Cause I've, it's, you know, when it comes to me, it's always a rush, right? It's always, we gotta get it done. We gotta get it done. So I've seen that. I've seen where we've waited six months. I've seen where we've waited six years. And I've seen where we've not waited and we pay the money to get on the court and get it done. I, I, there's a, I think there's a formula they have. They have a lot of money. That's mandated, right? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. What I could do, though, is maybe try to get Yvonne to come one time. <laughs> yeah. Yvonne, yeah. she's amazing. Yeah, she'd probably do something with me. Um, but I don't know. That would be a question for the attorney directly. I'm sure that, and I try to tell people, look, where's the property located? Because you're getting an attorney here, in, your property's in Solano County. You're paying a Sacramento attorney. I just know you're already paying more money, <laughs> period. You are, you know, and you want to you want it to be with somebody that maybe is recommended that you feel good about. But you also have to remember if you're in San Francisco or you're there to there, you're paying for that, that difference. So the, the bottom line is the best knowledge you can give to your clients is for them to get a living trust, to make sure that they have their, you know, their assets covered. Some people care and some people don't care. Some people are like, I don't care. I'm going to use the money I want and I'm going out. <laughs> I'm going out. I don't really care. But a lot of people do. And you've got a lot of people that don't understand how title works. They think they have a will. They think that it's going to be covered or, you know, or maybe my mom had a trust, but maybe it's not even on title. I've had a client that owns quite a bit of property around here. He brings me this list of his 15 properties, you know, and like half of them were in the trust, the other half were not, but they got each checked, you know, because they're older. So we can pull that information. If you have clients that just want to know, we were happy to pull the deeds for you. Please reach out to Sarah or myself and we can pull that information so that you know and that your clients know. But it would behoove you to even go back and look at your old clients, you know, back in the day too, because if they're on title as joint tenants, that's a conversation piece. I'm just going to go off the past 10 years. It's been quite a while now, probably around that time. 
Uh, okay. Next question is who orders the appraisal when a person of a trust dies to have the property value? Of the trust? Oh, I don't, you know what? I hear all kinds of things. If I would had my, if, if I knew a family member that just passed, I would immediately call one of my local appraisers. I want somebody locally here. I don't want somebody from another area. It can be, I think they, I want to, honestly, I think they can validate anything as long as it's a valid appraisal because I've had family members that are, have done their own. Like you guys, or the agents can do, a, what do you call it, a CMA? CMA a broker price opinion but you want to have that in writing especially if you got one through an appraiser it's that should be solid enough but the county also knows the value you guys because they're taxing you every single year right so if you give them some crazy amount there they know where the values are but if you can prove to them based on this appraisal which is fun as proof i think that that would suffice i don't know 100 percent, but that's what my take is on it because they're calling us constantly for the values and I think they write it on the tax bill too, the assessed value. Oh yeah, this yeah. Is the, yep, they're on the value every year. And the counties call us to get the date of the death so they can go back and tax the people. So, so I've done that side. I've just done a, a written form as a broker price opinion and said, based on this date, the date of death, the value is this based on these variables, and I write a supporting document that's on there. So you can, and, and it may not be accepted, but it's free or freeer. Um, yeah. 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 It's, it's a service that you can provide. Now, and it's a huge service because they are going to be coming back to you. Even if they don't need that right then, they're going to be coming back to you going, do you have that? Because the county is now hitting them with that bill and they're going to want to find that original paperwork to make sure that they're, they're assessing it correctly. So I have a question. In terms, so when someone passes away, oh, they say people the person sure. so mm -hmm. when those people pass away the property gets reassessed yes the county has um the county the minute the county assessor gets wind that anybody passes away on anybody's property oh, with, with, right. they're like at the end now do i get a piece of your pie period period. Now, if the other person's still alive and they're married, great, they can't touch it. But if the other person was an un un unmarried woman, an unmarried man, they can touch it. And then they're going to reassess at 50% of the value at today's rate. And not, they can't touch the whole 100%, but they can hit you with the 50% or whatever the entity was that they owned, whatever their share was. And they do it. They call us constantly. I get phone calls almost every day on that. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah. So anybody that passes, definitely give them your analysis of what the market is at that time. So you tell them keep it because you know they're going to need it. They will definitely need that. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Perfect. All right, you guys. And there's none here on Zoom well, land. Thanks for being such great um, players with me today. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, everyone on Zoom land. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. 